So I have three questions to start. What is the stuff of life? How do we make life? And how do we know when we've made it? It's okay for me telling you I might make life, but how do we know? Or how do we know when we discovered new life? Now, I'm a chemist, and I try and make molecules in my lab. And take this rock here on the screen. This rock is actually LAH84001. This is a very famous rock, a rock found in Antarctica. And it was so famous and so exciting that Bill Clinton got on TV and said, we have found life in this rock. Can you see it? I'm not sure I can. But I guess if you look at that kind of long, wiggly little thing that could be a fossilized worm or bacterium, we may call that life. Or can we? It's quite clearly dead. But maybe it was living at some point in the, in the past on Mars. And this is a very interesting point, that we are trying desperately to find our place in the universe by doing experiments like looking for Higgs or looking for the radiation at the background of the universe with a Planck telescope. And the question we have really is, why is it the planet Earth is alive, as you can clearly see by this nice blue color? This blue color means photosynthesis. This white color means water. But now look at Mars. Mars looks quite clearly dead. Was Mars always dead? Or is Mars, in fact, alive right now that we just can't see those microbes? Clearly, Mars is not as, as alive as Earth. So we really wish to ask, how come Earth is alive? This seems a, f a fairly interesting question, but we really have no idea. So let's take these two videos here. Are these dead or alive? I'll let you study them for a moment. The right-hand side is a little bit more animated, but I'll, I'll give you the answer. The right-hand side is dead. This is a tube made in my, my lab. And the right-hand side is germination, quite clearly alive. But if you could see on the right-hand side this nice long structure, doesn't it remind you of the long structure in the meteorite? Yeah, this structure was made in my lab using inorganic materials. And so we can be fooled quite easily by things that are supposed to be uh, uh, dead or alive. So in my quest to make life, I need to be able to have a test to kind of ensure that I can convince my critics or the potential users that we've in fact made some kind of life. But we can perhaps begin to think about an indistinguishability test. You want technology or the best technology to be indistinguishable from nature. And this inspiration allowed me to say, well, who cares if there's a thing called life or death, if you can't tell the difference? So we figured that maybe we could have a Turing test for life. So what I would do is go to my laboratory and make my inorganic cell from scratch. No DNA, no proteins, nothing to cheat, just dead stuff. And then I make my cell. And then I use an indistinguishability test, just like in the Turing test, to find out if you're a conscious entity or a, or, or a computer. Sometimes when I'm teaching undergraduates, I want to do a Turing test because I'm not sure there's anyone there. <laughs> so how does this Turing test work? Well, you have an interrogator. In this case, it's an alien interrogator. And they're interrogating either a human being or a computer, and they have to tell the difference. In the case of a life for life, you would have a cell that was living, that was trying to interrogate between your, your homemade cell and a real cell. And if your se living cell could not tell the difference, then functionally that is alive, and you've crossed the line. And the reason I wanted to kind of present this as an idea, to build on this, is because making life is going to be full of controversy, of whether we've actually crossed that line from non-life into life. And I would argue it doesn't matter. Because life is a very funny thing that we're trying to pin down. So how did we get to life, and how am I going to make life in the lab so we can actually pose this question? And I think this is an important step that we need to make. And the problem with finding life is that, although you may think I'm a little bit crazy if I tell you I'm going to make life in the lab, we do have life on planet Earth. And really, it's just a question of scale. Life took around about 400 million years to emerge on planet Earth. That's quite a long time, but it's not a huge amount of time. The sea has a pretty big volume. There's lots of molecules of water in the sea, say 10 to the 45 molecules. That's quite a lot of molecules. That is almost as many molecules uh, of water as there are kilograms in the observable universe. So it's a very big number. 
And then if you take all the seconds that elapsed in that 400 million years, the number of collisions that could have happened, you get a whopping 10 to the 53 events. So that's a really nice playing field to roll your dice to find life. I'm going to find life. Keep looking. So perhaps the reason why we think about life or the emergence of life is this issue of time scale. But I don't have 400 million years, even with um, uh, anti-aging. <laughs> So how am I going to do it? How are we going to find life in the lab? Well, we need to take our planet Earth and chop it up. Maybe take an ocean, maybe take Darwin's pond, maybe take a flask in a test tube, and then go further, go smaller, make artificial cells, proto-cells, and get those cells to behave like living cells. So eventually, we end up with a very prim primitive bacterium. So our idea is, to, is nothing less than to put the elements required for life that aren't living, just the carbon, the nitrogen, the oxygen, the minerals, in a machine, and take that machine all the way through the scale, and out at the end, you want to get your living cell. And we can use any elements we want, because my theory, or the theory that's emerging in my laboratory, is that the process is more important than the material. But let's talk about probability before we get bogged down in chemistry. Now, I just want you to imagine that you've got a load of dice and you're going to roll them. And, you, and I, I don't know who's lucky and wins the lotto uh, or, or is very good at blackjack or whatever, but think about how you would make a protein. So a protein with 154 amino, acid, 154 amino acids in a chain with 20 to choose from, if you're going to randomly make that, it would require you to throw the dice a whopping, I guess, 10 to the 200 times. Now, that is a very, very very large number of times. In fact, it's so large, you're never going to get there. So that means God must have made everything, that in fact the creationists are correct, right? Well, I may not agree with that especially. Let's take an inorganic molecule, a molecule that I make in my lab in just a few seconds. This has 154 metals and six positions. So it's like a, now it's like a dice, but 154 of them. So I'd have to roll 154 of these dice and get all the numbers that I've written down to make my ring. But yet, I can make my ring in the lab in about, about a second. Actually, it's about 500 milliseconds. So in 500 milliseconds, I can roll one in 10 to the 119. That's completely crazy, or is it? Well, of course, it's not about probability. It's about using the laws of chemistry. And what we need to do in this quest to build life is to really unpick those laws of chemistry. And what I want to say is that life exists in this universe of chemistry. And so it's a very unconnected universe. All the possible drugs are there. All the possible diseases are there in biochemistry. All the possible materials are in this universe of chemistry. So how can we explore that universe? This is the problem. It's not that we're fantastically improbable. That, that clearly is not the case. But we need to find a way to explore that universe. Now, the way I've started to do it in my lab is to basically get as many flasks as we can and connect them together with pipes to start to mix all the chemicals in different time and space. And you can see this happening here. You can see all the pumps and all the wires. It all looks very complicated. I only have four vessels here. Imagine if I want a trillion. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to wire things very well in my lab. It will turn into a mess very quickly. I would suggest that this is a problem akin to the transistor. The first transistor, which was huge, when the first transistor was kind of realized, people could conceptually design a computer. How could you get from a huge transistor to the microprocessors of today? It was just a question of scale. And so what we're trying to do is to somehow create a chemical internet by fusing together 3D printed devices that can plug and play to take this complexity and just plug them together. And that's what we're doing in my lab right now. It's a very good excuse to use 3D printers. And I guess when I'm, when I'm away, they're printing all sorts of things. But when I'm there, they tend to be printing these reactors. So what we're trying to imagine is a 3D printed chemical engine that's plug and play. So we can do lots of things with this. But really, my vision, I want to make life. All the other stuff will come, but I want to make life. And I need to be able to engineer as many possible events in a small space and time, because I'm not going to live for 400 million years. So we're building a chemical engine. And the chemical engine itself will print the, the architecture on the fly. The, fly the, the architecture will be defined by the chemistry at the same time. 
And not only that, we will then do the chemistry in the 3D printed device. So the 3D printer will become the chemist. It will become the chemistry set. And we will do this in vast arrays. And by printing in 3D, we can suddenly build, put lots of reactions together in real time and in space. And this has many applications beyond getting life. But go back to the Higgs. We wanted to get the Higgs, and the technologies flow out of that for other things. We want to try and make life in the lab, and I'm, ho I'm hopeful the technology will flow out for other things. So one idea is, if we've made life, or we've made an engine where we can evolve molecules of life, then we'll be able to embed molecular networks for drugs, for molecules and materials we want to make. We'll be able to screen them and then scale them. And so we'll have a kind of uh, machine that will allow us to discover and build other molecules. And so then this allows us to take chemistry, if you like, into the information space, where molecules can be represented by numerical blueprints. And we're trying to build a chemical HTML in my lab at the moment by using the laws of chemistry and informatics. And when we do this, we have to do this chemistry. We have to build these networks. So we're building a generational network where we can have breeding, cross-fertilization that mimics what you get in nature. And it's basically making, taking a load of chemicals and mixing them up in a blender, but doing it a billion, billion, billion times. Although this slide looks complicated, it's nothing more than that. And the idea is that we'll get evolving matter coming out. Well, we've made some inorganic cells in the lab. They're minimal nanomolecules. They can undergo some aspects of replication. We call them eye shells. They react in their environment, and they have a metabolism. But they need something more, and this is the thing I'm going to leave you. The, the life is not just about chemistry. It's about a process that we call evolution, in a strict sense. This process of evolving molecules in the device. And the way this would work is rather than just copying the molecule faithfully, making a perfect copy as we are here, we would make a polymer, and that polymer could mutate. And you can see the analogy with DNA. So we need to build mutatable molecules into our net chemistry network. So how would this work? How will we build this in the lab? Because I've told you about having this chemical internet on one hand, this 3D printer over here, but is it just a load of fancy words? How are we going to implement this? So the way we're attempting to do it in the lab, so if you take the, right, the left-hand side here, this is actually our huge scale reactor. You'll be able to see a spark in the middle there. And this is where we're going to shovel in the elements required, a bit like um, a really primordial reaction. So we can come from the smallest, simplest molecules. We're not going to put in, we're not going to cheat by putting in synthetic DNA. We're not going to cheat by putting in synthetic proteins. We are going to come from the minimum chemistry set. But that, so that's our kind of flask or our warm pond of Darwin. Then we have all these different pumps and flow systems you can see in the bottom there, where we have this uh, small reactor filling up. And then on the right-hand side, you saw these cells moving, these, these artificial cells that were flowing in a microfluidic device. And I think by the combination of the big engine having the big-scale chemistry being scaled down, smaller and smaller, and then using evolution, we will be able to discover a whole range of new molecules and cells with lifelike properties. And when we start to get hung up on, is it life or is it dead, we can just start to think about our test for life. And then we can hang, get, get ourselves out of this, this potential infinite loop of discussion about have we made life, and is it dead, and is it a virus, and then start to think about the implementation of the technologies that will result. And I think that's a, a pretty important step that we need to try and take. So just imagine in a few years when we've built the reactor in my lab and we have this massive scale system where we can do a, a trillion, trillion, trillion reactions every second. And not only can we do a trillion reactions a second, but we can network them. And by networking, we can access a much bigger space. So what will come out of that space? So this is the question. What will emerge? And I guess what will emerge will be an evolvable inorganic system. And what we're calling it at the moment is rather fancifully inorganica, because this will be the first life form that we find that is not based on DNA or proteins. Thank you very much.